Yes. This is a meeting for those of you who are planning to apply to medical, MD, or osteopathic medical school, veterinary medical school, or dental school next summer 2013 to matriculate in summer 2014. It is a daunting but true fact that we have to begin the formal side of this process for 2014 while we're still in 2012. I'm going to pass around a hand, a, a, a sign-in sheet, and I'd like you, if you have not signed in already, to do so. It asks you on the right-hand side if you're um, applying, and you're going to make your best guess about that. I realize that some of you are here, and you're undecided about whether you're going to apply or not next summer or the year after, and um, that's just fine, obviously. You can hear what um, I have to say. We all have important responsibilities to fulfill if your applications are going to be as successful as we hope they will be. My responsibilities include advising you about the application process before and during it, and supporting your applications to the medical schools with an evaluation letter from Williams. We will be sending also your other recommendation letters with that one to the medical schools. And I'll be talking about the way that those are gathered um, soon. So those are my responsibilities. Your responsibilities include getting us the information I need to write you an excellent letter uh, in a timely way and applying yourselves um, early enough so as to um, guarantee some modicum of success. When I talk about us, the us is, is me and Linda Moran, who functions as the health professions assistant within the Career Center. Many of you know Linda. She's a, a front desk person, um, longtime front desk person in um, the Career Center and she supports my letter writing and the letter sending um, during the summers. I want to start tonight by talking about some terminology with which you'll um, become, be becoming very familiar. The AAMC is the mothership of all MD medical education in this country, from pre-med education right through residency. They support medical education, allopathic education. The AAMC uh, sponsors the MCAT, the test you have to take if you're MD, the AMCAS, which is the application process that you are soon going to be participating in, and they produce the medical school admissions requirements, which is, um, used to be a big fat book because it was full of all the 130 MD medical schools and information about them. Now, it's a skinny book because they want you to um, uh, do everything online, which we Kaji pre-med advisors are not so crazy about, but which you should like because you're able to manipulate the data uh, to discover, for instance, by putting in your GPAs and MCAT scores, what medical schools would accept you uh, around the country. So there are ways uh, of uh, using their, their systems online that you uh, will find very helpful. The medical school admissions requirements uh, new edition comes out every April. Uh, you can subscribe to it now. I usually recommend that people do so in the year that they're applying. 1995 for the online version I think gets you this as well, but the online version is going to be more helpful to you. So the medical school admissions requirements, good book to have, and more reliable than some of the other guides to medical schools that might be out there. <coughs> Uh, the dentists among you um, um, have two resources. ADEA is the Professional Dental Association. The ADA sponsors the DAT, which is the test that all dentists-to-be must take. Um, osteopathic medical education, um, this is the service, a COMIS, uh, that one applies through, very like AMCAS. Um, and people who want to be osteopathic physicians also take the MCAT. If you want to be a vet, this is your application service, VIMCAS. You may take usually the GRE. Sometimes they'll accept the MCAT. 
in case you feel like taking the MCAT, um, when you could take the easier and shorter GRE. But some people have an epiphany after they take the MCAT that they really want to be veterinarians. And they did devise a VCAT, uh, an application test just for vet school, but not so many schools use that. Probably you'll be taking um, the GRE and will be happy to do so. And the other things I'll, I'll talk about later. So some terminology, there's lots of acronyms with which you'll become very familiar. What are the things that need to be done first? Uh, by February 1st, or earlier if you like, I need to receive your completed autobiographical information form. That's the first thing in your packet. You can hand deliver that to the Career Center or send it as a word attachment uh, to me. Uh, you're not going to fill out this particular one. I copied it off probably wastefully uh, to show you, but it's right here online. If you go to my website and go down to the application, it's right here. And I won't open that up because it looks just like this, but that's the autobiographical information form. And you can fill it out online, print it out, send it as a PDF, whatever, to me. Now, um, this is a tricky little move on my part, not only to get me the information that I need to write you a really good evaluation letter, but also to get you thinking about some of the perhaps difficult questions that the medical school application service is going to ask you anyway about your motivation and preparation for medical school. So you'll see some of the questions I ask you are, are, are similar to questions you'll see later. And you need to begin thinking about the answers to those. You'll see as well, uh, some of this is very straightforward, there is an autobiographical essay. So you don't want to leave this until the last day of January to prepare. Because there's an autobiographical essay uh, of three to five pages that I ask you to write about yourself. I am the only person who sees that. So it doesn't need to be perfect grammatically. I'd like you to throw lots of information in there about yourself and your upbringing and your motivation, whatever comes to mind. Especially that sort of free-flowing writing might prompt uh, some thinking that you'll need to do anyway about more serious essays for the AMCAS application. So um, that I need, if you are um, intending to apply in 2013, that I need uh, no later than February 1st. I'm going to create my list of likely 2013 applicants from those autobiographies and start sending that group emails. I'll begin conducting hour-long interviews with 2013 applicants on March 1st. I'll let you know when you can begin um, signing up for those interviews, but it will probably be the first week of February, uh, after the first few days of February, when I have uh, a reliable list about uh, of who's applying. You'll call the regular number, 597-2311, to make that appointment with me. Be sure to specify with whoever answers that you need an appointment with me for the hour-long uh, required med school application interview. I will have set times for those arranged in April, March and April, and you need to sign up for one of those set times, first come, uh, first served. You will need to have your autobiography in before that interview can occur. No autobiography, uh, no appointment. If you have a draft of your AMCAS personal statement that you want me to review, I'm happy to do so and to go over that with you during that hour. But I need the, the um, uh, essay at least 48 hours before your appointment with me. And there may be some time later for me to go over that essay with you as well. But that could be one of the things that happens in that hour. Come to that interview with questions about your particular situation. There will be time in the interview for you to get all of your questions answered about the application process and for us to talk about which medical, dental, or vet schools uh, would be um, logical for you to apply to. It would be helpful for me if you came 
with some uh, idea of the schools that you'd like to apply to. You can use that MSAR book. Those of you who are vet and dental students know that I have guidebooks for those as well. So come to that meeting with an idea about some schools that you'd like to um, apply to. It's going to be uh, an important part of what we're talking about in that time. This interview is not going to be scary at all for you. You should not be in intimidated by it. It's not going to be like a medical school uh, interview. Um, I'm just trying to get more information about you. I'll be referring a lot to your autobiographical information and asking you questions about that for clarification so I can write you the best uh, letter possible. Um, it may be that I sort of probe at some areas that I have um, concerns about as, as uh, medical schools will probe, but that's to sort of let you know some points about your application that I feel um, might need a little bit of improvement or are superb and that you should actually be selling um, more to the medical schools. So that will be a good and useful discussion um, for you. Now, if some of you are sitting there uh, uncertain as to whether you should even be applying next summer, that is a conversation that we should have before one of these interviews. And I'm happy to have that with you at any time. Maybe January before you write your autobiography would be a good time to have that. So we can talk about whether your candidacy for um, this coming summer is going to be viable or whether you actually should probably uh, wait and um, tweak a couple things. It would also be helpful to you and me if you brought to your interview this um, completed Excel spreadsheet in which you had calculated your science GPA. Um, as you probably know or, or can guess, your science GPA is going to be exceptionally important in um, evaluating your application to any of these professional schools. Your science courses are given more weight in the application process than regular courses. When you're setting down um, the information about your coursework, and I need to be clear that though you'll be requesting transcripts, you are not sending your transcripts to the individual medical schools. They're in every case going to these application services. When you're setting down your information, you need to have a transcript with you because it needs to be set down exactly as it's written on your, on your Williams transcript. And um, it's important that you designate which courses are lab courses. So that's easy. It's just as simple as saying the cell and lab, uh, biochemistry and lab, because they are weighted differently. And you want that credit in the final calculation. When you get your AMCAS application back, for example, you're going to see that your biology and physics lab courses are assigned 4.75 semester hours, which they round up to 4.8. Your chemistry lab courses are going to count for 5.25 semester hours. And all of your other courses at Williams are going to be um, 3.25, which they'll round up to 3.3. OK? You don't have to set that down. They figure that out in, at AMCAS HQ. But the reason that I want you to do the Excel spreadsheet is that when you get that processed AMCAS back and they say, OK, check your GPA, check to see if we've calculated your courses correctly, you want a rough idea of what that's going to be. OK? So obviously, this benefits people who have done well in their science courses and um, the opposite. Uh, for people who've not done as well in their science courses. But that's um, what you need. That's the, those are numbers that you need to be dealing with when you're looking at what GPAs 
the medical schools and other professional schools want to see, okay? So best that you're aware of that reality before you um, apply. You will be setting down credits, credits for each of your classes. How much, uh, how many credits is a Williams course worth? Same answer I got last night. One, one. Each Williams course is worth one credit, which is pretty wacky. If you've taken courses anywhere else, you've probably noticed that they're more like three or four credits a piece. I've worked at a number of institutions, and this is the first one I've worked at where there are only one, one credit. So, uh, but this is, uh, you'll have a um, clue about this because it's on your, on your APR. You'll see that everything's worth one credit. So how much are uh, vocal and instrumental music credit uh, courses worth? Half a credit, 0.5, right. So you're gonna put those down in your AMCAS application. And you're going to put down the fact that a given course is a lab course, but you don't have to do this semester hour calculation. That's done for you. When it comes back to you, though, you want a rough idea of what it's going to be. And that's why, long story short, if you um, can do this Excel calculation and bring it to me, or at least have it for yourself, you'll find that that's useful. What goes in these committee evaluation letters that I have to write for you? Just as, just as your guidance counselors in high school had to write a letter to the colleges on your behalf, I need to write a letter for everybody applying from Williams um, every year that compares you to the group of people that is applying that year from Williams. I am required to do this. Medical schools require it. If a school has a pre-med advisor and or a pre-med committee composed of faculty, um, somebody like that, and, and most schools will have um, somebody in that role. Um, <clears throat> the letters will always be positive. In them, I will lift up whatever I can about your candidacy that is positive. I will always discuss your academic record, your extracurricular pursuits at Williams, and your summer and academic year jobs with an eye toward comparing you to you, the cohort applying that year. So maybe you've been extraordinarily busy in terms of extracurriculars. Maybe you took a um, particularly challenging course load. These are things that I will note in um, the letter. I don't consider it my role to keep you out of medical school. I don't think that I have a gatekeeper role. So in that, I'm not going to say anything in my letter that's going to uh, damn you in this process. I think it's up to the medical schools to make those decisions uh, about you. So my letter is going to be positive. I'll talk about whatever I can about you that is uh, positive. And um, so you should pre be proceeding at least um, knowing that the Williams backing for your application um, is, is going to be um, as, as uh, uplifting as, as it possibly can be. My evaluation letter, and indeed all of your recommendation letters, will be uploaded to a server managed at Duke University by very smart people. And that system's name is VE Collect over there. Um, the VE Collect process is a relatively new one. Back in the old days, um, I had an assistant who collected all of the paper letters of recommendation for every applicant. And people were able to call her and say, has Professor So-and-So's letter come in? And then we would you know, physically copy all these letters and send them to the medical school. This is a much more efficient system whereby uh, the letters you request are sent to this uh, server. And um, when they're all collected and ready to go, 
you put your seal of approval on that set of letters, you don't get to see them, but you can at least say, yes, all, all the letters are in that I want to use. And then we send them uh, through a process called virtual avals to uh, the AAMC, to AMCAS, who then distributes them to your medical schools. And this all goes very well. Um, I also, my letter will be on top of the other letters that you're um, requesting. This VE collect process is, um, as I said, relatively new here. This is under the application, just so you should see it again. So this is the first page of my web page, so just go to the application. And here is information, welcome to VE Collect for applicants. Getting started, are you an applicant? Click there to register. They have videos for everything, all parts of VE Collect, and I, guess, and I suggest that you um, watch them. The first time that you register on VE Collect, you will need this super secret authorization code that only Williams students have. EPH 9955-7640686 dit slash dot. Don't laugh, you need this. And I'll know if you came here and then you write me in three weeks and say, uh, what was that authorization code? This is it, and this is the only place that you're gonna see it, because I don't publish it, okay? Um, we pay money to participate in these services. Uh, in fact, um, the only people I want registering this year are those folks who are certain they're gonna be applying next summer and current seniors. If you're here just sort of um, getting a, an idea of what's involved in the application process and aren't going to be applying for a couple years, please hold off registering. Medical schools, frankly, want more recent letters anyway, so don't use this to start collecting them. Okay? So that's how you register um, on VE Collect. You need to know that. There are all sorts of um, helpful, come on, behave. All sorts of helpful um, instructional videos, as I said, that PowerPoint is useful. L look at the PowerPoint before you begin registering, okay? So you make sure that you do things uh, properly. Something that you can begin doing now then, now that I've clued you in on VE Collect, is to think about from whom you are going to be requesting your letters of recommendation, which are a requirement of all of these professional schools. You'll request a minimum of four and a maximum of six in addition to mine. And at least two of those have to be from Williams Science faculty. Another letter might be from a doctor or a vet or a dentist with whom you've worked. Actually, this is practically a requirement, actually, for osteopathic medical schools, for vet schools, and for dental schools. You have to have a letter from a practitioner. Um, you, some of you might get three or four or five letters from science faculty here because you've been um, so involved in the sciences, but they can come from faculty in other departments, um, coaches, summer employers, campus employers, deans, um, other responsible adults who are familiar with the reasons that you want to enter medical, dental, or vet school. If you're not a science major, you probably will want to get a letter from your major department, um, especially if you do a thesis. I would think that the medical schools would think that was odd if you were a philosophy or an English major and you didn't get a letter from your department. So include those. Request letters from your recommenders early in the process. It's best if you can alert your recommenders 
that they're going to be getting an email from VE Collect. What happens is that you register your recommenders, including me, on VE Collect, you send send, they get an email saying, so and so has asked you for a letter of recommendation. Here's some information about the kinds of things that Jane Carey finds valuable in these letters of recommendation. There's some text that I was able to personalize for us. So if your recommenders say, well, how will I know what to say in the letter of recommendation? Once you send them the link, they'll see that. There's a whole bunch of tips from me about writing these letters. Okay? We want them to write you good letters, right? Um, the recommendations are all due no later than April 15th. There are faculty here who will say, don't worry, Jane knows that I'll get it in. And yes, Jane probably knows that. So um, don't push back too hard. There are faculty who will legitimately say, I'd write you a better one if I could write it at the end of the semester after you've had my course understandable and agreed. So do your best to get the bulk of them in by April 15th. The reason for their lateness should not be you. Don't be asking for these on April 1st just because you've been shy or something. You're going to need them. So start asking for them any time now. I start writing these committee letters in May and I begin writing with those who have all their letters in. Um, that's should seem fair. And also, if I know that somebody is particularly gung-ho and they've got all their MCAT scores in and they're all ready to go, I'm probably more inclined to write uh, for that person. But I do need all the letters of recommendation to write your letter. So um, keep that in mind um, as, you, as you're requesting letters and, and trying to get them in. Um, I write in the summer until they're all done. Um, this year I finished earlier than usual, which was um, the first week of August. I like to have them all done, obviously, before school starts. And, um, and it's part of my scheme to get you applying early also to get my part of the application uh, prepared. On or shortly after June 1st, certainly as soon after June 1st as possible, you're going to be submitting your applications to these services, AMCAS, ACOMAS, VIMCAS, or ADSAS. You're going to be submitting your application online. Um, I'll send you all an announcement about when those services go, li go live, but it's usually in May. You can begin filling out the application in May. There uh, are dates um, after which you can begin to submit it. You can't start submitting it until usually um, early June, but they're, but they're out there and you can begin um, checking them out. Um, if you went f to the AMCAS website right now, it would say AMCAS 2013, and you might say, oh, that's the year that I want to apply. I'm going to start filling this thing out right now. I know some of you. And no, uh, that is for a matriculation in 2013, so you would be going to a lot of trouble with the wrong application. They'll keep that 2013 one live for a while through the um, application deadlines later this year, and maybe even into the winter if they're lazy and the other one isn't, isn't ready. Um, so I'll tell you when those applications go live and when you could start working on them. You will uh, submit all of your application information electronically, and you will pay for that privilege with a credit or debit card. In 2012, just to give you an idea, AMCAS charged uh, a baseline application processing fee of $160 for one school and $34 for each school thereafter. I don't want you all applying to more than 20 schools. You think, 20 schools? I'm not going to apply to 20 schools. Well, I mean, there are 130 medical schools, and it is very competitive, and the national average is about 14 schools. 
you're only going to need to apply to 20 schools because you're going to be thinking carefully about the schools that are likely to accept you. Um, when you go on that pre-med scourge, studentdoctor.net, you will um, encounter people who are applying to 40, 50, 60 schools. Their parents might even have encouraged them to do this. This is idiocy, and you will not be doing it. And, <laughs> and they, they, while it's easy to tick off boxes and, uh, and pay for the privilege of writing, uh, of privilege of, of ticking off those boxes to AMCAS, um, will never, never fill out all those secondaries. Because after you submit your primary, then you'll get requests for secondaries. And there is no way that people will fill out all of those secondary applications. So that's just folly in the first place. So think carefully about the number of schools and which schools you want to apply to. And you and I will talk about it. Some of you will not need to apply to very many schools. Some of you will probably apply to 20. And, and some of you who um, are applying to the same schools as everybody else might need to apply um, to more schools, but never more than 20. Um, um, there are very few reasons that I will entertain for people to apply to more than 20 schools. They usually involve love, to which I'm not unsympathetic, uh, love in the face of uh, my boyfriend is also applying to law school and he doesn't know where he's going to get in, so I have to apply to blah, 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 blah. Okay, okay. I get, <laughs> I get worn down easily by love, but um, um, uh, kind of tough about other, other reasons that you might have. I will entertain them, but reserve the right to say no. So. There is a fee assistance program that helps you reduce these fees. Let's go back here. Let's just click, click on AMCAS and the Comus. You know, I forgot to show you something that I want to show you about that Excel spreadsheet. I'm just going to back up a minute here. Under that AMCAS and a Comus, it's, it says at Williams. There's the uh, link to that Excel spreadsheet, okay? So you don't have to scrounge for that. Okay, so let's go back. Okay. Click on AMCAS. There is a fee assistance program, and if you're on a lot of financial aid at Williams, you should investigate this. I, the fastest way I found it was under the FAQs under AMCAS. Oh. Right here, the assistance program. It, um, it lets you apply up, um, to up to 14 schools um, at no cost. It gives you a big reduction in the cost of the, AM, of the MCAT. Um, I think there's some other good stuff like maybe a free copy of the MSAR or a free copy of the um, uh, preparation guide for the MCAT. And if AMCAS gives you the fee, uh, gives you um, 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 financial assistance through the FAP program, then the medical schools will also waive their secondary fees. What? You say secondary fees? What? Oh yes, oh yes. Did I neglect to mention that after you submit your primary application to AMCAS, that you're going to be getting requests from the schools to fill out secondaries? And oh, each one of those costs between $50 and $100 to submit, okay? Can you say racket? Yes, yes. And in most cases, all of the medical schools will uh, send a secondary application to everybody, whether they're, whether they're qualified uh, or not, to attend because they want your money. Um, so uh, more reason to think very carefully about the medical schools to which you'll be applying. 
and sometimes you look at a secondary and it'll be quite daunting and you'll say, well, I guess I didn't really want to apply to that school in the first place. So even those of you with uh, the best will will get uh, a little bit worn down um, completing secondaries. Um, all of the schools <coughs> in the country, all the MD schools, um, participated in AMCAS in 2012, except the Texas schools. Um, who's here from Texas? It's a good thing to be from Texas uh, because there's a lot of state schools, except that you need to fill out this other whole application, TMD SAS, Texas Medical Dental School Application Service, whether you're applying to medical or dental school. Um, it is uh, required if you're applying to their state schools. And uh, curiously, um, <laughs> their MD-PhD programs, if any of you are MD-PhD in Texas, participate in AMCAS. It's just the MD programs that, that don't. Baylor is a private school in Texas that participates in AMCAS. So even if somebody says, I'm from Texas, I want to go to medical school in Texas, they still need to apply to, through two different application services to cover all their uh, Texas bases. Um, all of the schools will want all of your transcripts from previous institutions. And that's one thing that you can get going on by the end of May, requesting those. In each case, there will be a form that you can download and send or take to various registrars, and that's something that you can be doing. Uh, this will be one of the biggest headaches for some of you who've taken uh, classes at other schools. Expect that it will be a hassle and uh, leave enough time. Many has, um, have, have, has the student been who um, waited a little long to get that summer school transcript and have that hold up the entire processing works for their AMCAS application, which has been inordinately uh, frustrating. You'll find um, that the Williams Registrar is very good about getting those, op those um, transcripts out in a timely fashion. When you make your request of this registrar, though, and this is, of course, um, germane only to those of you on campus, um, make, make it clear that you need the second semester grades on those. I have had students um, very earnestly in the past take that transcript request form into our registrar, say, please send my transcript to AMCAS and not specify that they needed to wait for the second semester grades, which of course you want on it. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, as I said, get a transcript for yourself, since when you're filling out the AMCAS or these other applications, you'll need to set it down semester by semester, uh, just as you took it um, with the proper uh, numbers and uh, titles. Don't rely on memory. What was the name of that English course I took as a second semester sophomore? No. Uh, look at a transcript and, and get it written down properly. There are human beings at the other end of AMCAS, and they are taking your transcript, uh, transcripts and comparing that information with what you're putting down in your AMCAS. And everything will come to a quick halt if it all doesn't, um, uh, doesn't line up. So that's an easy thing to do. A note about summer coursework, those of you who've taken courses in the summer, all summer coursework, whether it's done in the first or second summer session, um, is counted in the next ac academic year, okay? That's not intuitive, because you might think the first summer session might, is a little bit closer to the spring semester, but both go in the next academic year. The application services and the individual medical schools and I will be communicating with you almost exclusively by email. Most of the time, applicants will create a new email address and use it exclusively for the application process. If you create a new address um, just for these applications, Make sure it contains a significant chunk of your name. 
I, in particular, would appreciate looking at it and knowing um, who it belongs to and is in no way cute, okay? No skier, skier guy at Gmail or anything like that. Make sure that it contains uh, your name. And um, I think it's a good idea to create one just for the application process. Some students have even set up these new addresses by the time they, set, they submit their autobiographies um, on February 1st. Some have even done it earlier than that because VE Collect is going to want to know what your email address is. Now, after you set up this address, you've got to start uh, looking at it. I have people every year who are very indignant. You didn't send me. All my other friends are signed up for these interviews, and you didn't send me a list of those interview times. I said, well, I send it to your med school address. Oh, 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 they're expecting me to continue to send that kind of information to your current address, whereas I'm going to start using that med school address too. Okay? So after you set it up, you've got to look at it from time to time. And of course, you're going to look at it um, a lot because, as I said, that these medical schools, the application services, um, are, all, are going to do almost everything with you um, through email. Uh, let's assume that you do your submitting in early summer and that that seems to go smoothly. And there are ways to check that online, uh, the status of your application online. So you can, you can do that. Um, the next correspondence you get, um, even before your AMCAS or other application is processed, um, is probably going to come from individual med medical schools urging you to complete their secondaries. And um, uh, then it becomes even more important that you check your email every day after you've applied. Um, most schools, as I said, will send secondaries to everyone. You can check to see if the schools you've applied to do that through the MSAR online. There are schools that will do a pre-screen before they send the secondary, and that's exciting if you know that you have um, gotten a, a, a request for a secondary from a school that does a screen. Um, that says um, very promising things about the status of your application. In general, because they want your money, most of the schools will send a secondary to everybody. And it behooves you, if you can, to get those back um, as soon as possible. <clears throat> uh, a quirk of the system in the last few years, which is moderately annoying, is that you submit your AMCAS application one day, and the next day you get secondary requests. And you say, how can this be? I'm not even processed at AMCAS. Well, AMCAS, um, in cahoots with the medical schools, says, hey, Grace, Grace Lapierre has submitted her application and she's going to apply to BU. And BU says, oh, okay, okay, we're going to send her our, our secondary. And so right away, you start receiving these secondary applications. Now, you're not going to be reviewed until your processed AMCAS application and everything else is in there. But that's how fast you'll hear from some of these schools, just to give you a heads up about that. Now, if you're all done with the MCAT and um, are not having, uh, you know, are having some uh, free time, that is all fine and good. But some of you who should be studying for the MCAT instead, because you want to take it midsummer, are going to be distracted by this new inflow of applications that you feel that you need to be completing. So um, I just say focus on the MCAT. That's the most important thing. Set those aside temporarily until after your MCAT is complete if, you're, if you are indeed taking that uh, midsummer. It would be ideal if by Labor Day all the elements of your application for which you are responsible, including the secondary apps, are received by the schools. Do not, do not pay any attention to application deadlines. You are going to apply so far ahead of the posted application deadlines 
the earliest of which I think is Michigan at September 30th, and then they become October 15th, November 1st, on and on and on through. You are going to apply way before those. Why? Why? Because some of these schools have rolling admission. All of the schools have a limited number of interview dates. And once they've given those all away, that's that. No matter how great you may look, they may not have a spot for you. Now, most of the schools who will interview into March and April will save a few seats for those people. But certainly, when the schools begin reviewing applications in um, August, say, and they start seeing excellent candidates all complete and slotting them in for interviews, um, um, they are going to um, run out of interview slots eventually. So your odds when you apply late of being waitlisted or not being considered um, greatly increase. It's absolutely critical that you apply as early as you can. It, every year it makes a huge difference. I see people getting a lot of interviews and getting in nice and early. Apply early, interview early, hopefully get in early. There is rolling admission among some medical schools. There are a lot of, uh, there are some uh, very good medical schools, Harvard, Penn, Johns Hopkins, um, Yale, that will hold all of their decisions until February or March, which sort of clogs up the works. But there are enough schools with rolling admission um, that um, uh, a number of uh, this year's group are in already somewhere. And that's a very nice thing, obviously, for them. The issue of the MCAT and when you should take it is something that you and I need to discuss. Um, September is the latest date, as most of you know, for when the MCAT is given. You do not want to be taking the MCAT in September if you're applying that year. Uh, there are some people who will plan to take it nice and early, April, May, June, and then get the score back and not be happy with it and want to retake it again. I understand that, but since there's a 30-day turnaround on that MCAT score, um, it will significantly delay your application. So we need to, you and I, and this is not a, a, a universally applied rule that I can share with you, you and I need to talk about your individual circumstances and whether that is um, a good course of action for you to repeat. And it may, may well be if, you're, if your application is otherwise strong and you just need to improve by a couple points, it might be okay for you to take it later in the summer. But that's something that you and I each need, uh, need to discuss as individuals. I need, we need, Linda Moran and I need, a processed copy of your application, AMCAS, ACOMAS, FIMCAS. Indeed, we won't send your collected letters of recommendation until we have that processed copy. I don't mean the one that you submit. I mean the copy that the application services say is all, re all ready to go to the schools. It just needs your check. You're going to send that as a PDF to Linda. And she operates very fast thereafter. If your letters are all re collected and ready to go, we can get that, those letters out to, the, uh, to um, AMCAS. We'll send them to the schools very quickly. But we need a process copy. I'll be nagging you about that um, regularly. Um, there may be MD-PhD applicants among you. For MD-PhD, your recommendation should be heavily science-oriented. Um, in the in the our interview, be sure to tell me if you're interested in MD PhD pro, MD PhD programs, as there is extra stuff you need to do um, for AMCAS as a separate MD PhD application. It will influence the way I tell you how to proceed uh, if I know that you're doing medical scientist uh, training. Um, it is possible to apply to some MD-PhD programs and some MD programs. Um, you can't do that at the same school. 
Um, and that is because if you're not considered for the MD-PhD program at a given school, they'll consider you for the MD program anyway. Okay, But it's possible to mix that up. So that's something that we'll be talking about. Those of you who are MD-PhD um, have probably identified yourselves to me um, anyway at this point. Your, your letters need to be very heavily science-oriented. You have in front of you an application timetable. Let's go back here. Um, while useful, I hope, um, it won't be quite as useful Mm. No, let's see here. Anyway, um, on, on my website, it's a very clear um, link um, to the application timetable. So you can refer to this one, but there are some valuable links uh, within that. The bottom three handouts, in the interest of time, I won't pour over. They're sort of self-evident. You've got two years worth of folks and where they are, um, are in medical school now. Um, some other sort of um, things to think about when you're applying, uh, which you can read at your leisure. There are workshops you should attend in the spring. Um, one is a combination AMCAS personal statement writing workshop and an application tips workshop. I'll be telling you about that. And the other is a panel of this year's applicants who are at Williams called What I Learned While Applying. So stay tuned uh, for those. Um, when you apply to these application services, they're going to ask you about institutional actions. Um, and I will as well. And you need to be very honest with me about whether there's something um, nefarious or just a little tiny bit nefarious in your past. When you're accepted to medical schools, your, in, your, your name is instantly given over to agencies that do a criminal background check. And if they find anything in that that you haven't disclosed to the medical schools when they ask, have you had any institutional actions? That will not go well for you. So it's best to fess up about the can of beer you were holding and got busted with at age 17 in high school, dumb as it seems, because that, if you were um, arrested for that or it was even a misdemeanor, it might show up on the criminal background check. Will it keep you out of medical school? No, of course not but the medical schools won't look kindly on your not mentioning it. So anything like that that you have, anything that you think, no matter how dumb or irrelevant you think it is, please mention um, to me. And obviously, if there's anything more serious, like an institutional action here or some felony, um, do be very honest with me about that as well. So we can talk about how you're going to present that to the medical schools. Um, there aren't too many of those types of things that are, are total deal breakers. In conclusion, this is a long, expensive, emotionally exhausting process in which you need to be at the top of your game. Um, we all do. If you apply half-heartedly or against advice, or without confidence, without confidence, you will not be as successful as you would like to be. And I want you to succeed. I never tell people, you're not going to get in, don't apply, um, you have no business applying. I have never said that to anybody. But I might say to you, um, to make a stronger application, um, it would be probably better if you did some more of this or that. And you can take that advice or not. As I said, take it or leave it. I'm still going to write you the most positive letter I can. 
But um, because it is such an emotionally exhausting process and so expensive, um, it's ideal if you only have to do it once. Right. Questions? Don't be shy. Whatever you're thinking, somebody else is. Do you have questions about recommendations? Do you have questions about MCATs? Yes, Katie. Well, if you're not applying for a year, you, can, you, you may, you can. Uh, if it's going to be a couple of years, please don't register, no, because there, there will be a slot with your name on it. And as I said, there's no point in doing it because the medical schools don't want you applying with this letter from 2010 when you're applying. They want to see more current letters. So you can certainly give your recommenders a heads up before you graduate. Those of you who are going to be taking a couple years off can say, Professor Smith, Professor Richardson, Professor Go, um, I, I'll probably be asking for a letter of recommendation down the road. And they'll say, OK. And write you a very good one. But it's nice for them to know. Yes. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And I know, I, I see a couple people here who I know are doing post back who aren't even going to have any science letters from Williams, Sophie, right? And they're saying, ah, two science letters from Williams. I'm not going to have two science letters from Williams because I'm going to be taking all my science classes at somewhere else. Obviously, there need to be um, exceptions to this. But if you took the bulk of your science classes here, I will expect two letters. But yes, if you studied abroad and had a good relationship with a professor, and the letter comes in English, <laughs> in well-written English. I read all these letters. You don't need to worry. Um, I, I read them all. And I read them because um, there have certainly been a number of occasions where they'll start off writing about um, um, Dorothy and end up writing about Bob. And I need to catch that. There's a lot of gender confusion in the letters um, uh, that I need to catch, or some egregious typo that they would never have, have meant. Um, and people are always happy to be alerted about this, and they fix it, and you don't know the difference. But um, I also, um, behind my letter, um, order the letters and quite purposefully in terms of utterly fabulous back to very good um, because they're all going to be good. And that is with an eye toward somebody you know, sleepily reading your file some night. Maybe they only get through the first three or four letters. I want them to see the best stuff right away. So this is something I do. And it hasn't happened in a long time that I've had to tell somebody this is a really harmful letter. <laughs> this, you know this letter is going to keep them out. Are you aware of that? Or, or uh, when I was at Princeton, once in a while I had to say, you are saying things that none of the other recommenders is, is saying. Do you, do you really want, is that really what you want to say? And if they say yes, I say, OK. Uh, <laughs> OK, we'll put that on the bottom. <laughs> Yes, Maria. I feel like this percentage is probably online, but like, what percent of students do science and matriculate get into all of that? Got in? Yes, they went to the medical school. Uh, last year was 85%. Okay. Yeah, the year before that it was 89%. You know what the national average is? 45%. 45%. So. Smart in and smart out. So, you all would do very well uh, even without me. I'm convinced of that. So, yeah. 
it's a tough process. And um, somebody says, well, why isn't it 100%? Why aren't it 100%? And I said, well, because we don't prohibit anybody from applying. Anybody can apply who wants to apply. And some people are made to apply by their parents uh, or um, think that they just want to take a chance at it or something. And I'm not going to stand in your way. I can talk myself blue in the face sometimes, but uh, I'm not going to prohibit you from doing that. OK? All right, see you around. Thank you.